Well, we're going on to page 32. Which in the textbook is page 154. This is chapter 5. I'm going on to my second of four two-way binders right now with my notes. And I wanted to first talk about this flow chart. You'll see this flow chart, these kind of flow charts in the harder chapters for those of you who like a global view of stuff. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I've just posted it online. Uh, but these are the sections that will make up this chapter, and they're basically different types of reactions that are related to the reactions we've already done for the most part. What we're going to tackle first is the big monster on the left called net ionic equations. Okay? Uh, and that'll involve electrolytes, solubility rules, and precipitation reactions. So uh, first we're going to tackle what's called electrolytes. So let's do that. So beginning of chapter five here. Aqueous solutions. So uh, solutions that are in water. Okay? And specifically the reactions in aqueous solutions. Uh, and we're going to start off uh, 5.1 with electrolytes. <coughs> okay. Electrolytes have the ability to ionize. So if you're a compound and you can ionize into a cation and an anion, you are an electrolyte. Okay? It forms ions. And those ions are good conductors of electricity, actually, which you'll find out in Chem 2C. You can actually calculate the amount of electricity they can provide via the voltage. Uh, and you can uh, you know, learn how to power things. 2C is really interesting for this whole section here uh, that steps on, uh, on the backs of chapter 5. Uh, there's different kinds of electrolytes. There can be strong or synonymously good, okay, strong or good electrolytes. And then there can be weak or bad electrolytes or non-electrolytes. What your textbook does is separates these into three categories, the strong or good ones, and then the weak ones, and then the non. But practically speaking, I put the weak and the non-electrolytes together because effectively they produce the same results for us. Um, so, you're going to see me combine the weak and the non-electrolytes where your textbook does not. Uh, and I just do that for practical reasons. Uh, you don't need to, though. Uh, there can be a weak electrolytes that, item, uh, compounds that slightly make ions. They do it a little bit, maybe 5%. The strong electrolytes make a lot of ions. Non-electrolytes make zero ions. Okay, so non and weak are effectively the same. How do you tell the difference? Good that you asked. I'm going to make a strong category and then a weak <coughs> slash non-electrolyte. So strong electrolytes or weak non-electrolytes. Okay. Let's do the strong first. What's a strong electrolyte? Well, a strong acid, if it's aqueous, a strong base, Again, if it's aqueous. You can have a strong base that's solid. That would not be a strong electrolyte. So specifically as aqueous strong base. Okay, uh, something that's ionic, again, if it's aqueous. And then something that's a salt. What the heck is a salt? Salt and ionic are equivalent as far as we're concerned. So when you hear the word salt, we mean ionic. It's just that in this chapter, common verbiage uh, is to say salt instead of ionic. Okay, so you see both of those terms. Okay, how about weak or non-electrolytes? Okay, what would those be? Well, a weak, in contrast to a strong acid, a weak acid. Any state. So aqueous salt, it doesn't matter. Or a weak, likewise a weak base. Again, any state. Uh, molecular compounds, remember the moleculars? They have no metals in them. So 
those compounds. Uh, organic compounds, we did those too. Again, those don't have metals really either. And then to be more specific about the states, anything that's a liquid, a solid, or gas. So for example, if I had a solid strong base, that's a weak or non-electrolyte. Okay? But if I have an aqueous strong base, that's a strong. So I'm not going to give this to you on an exam. You'll have to know this stuff. Okay? Now one thing you're going to ask me, how do I tell the difference between a strong and a weak acid? You're going to learn that in this chapter. The second common question is, how do I determine the states of something, whether it's aqueous or solid? You'll also get to learn that in this chapter. So that's uh, electrolytes. And there's a video called Electrolytes 1 on YouTube. Now, I want to call your attention to the bottom of page 33 before we go of the video. Uh, I realized a couple quarters into teaching about 10 years ago or something. We assume, and the textbook assumes you know all the stuff in this table coming into the class, or you're bored with it, somehow you know this stuff. But uh, then I realized nobody knows it. So I made it into a table for you. I'm pushing this on the textbook because they assume you know it. You need to know this, and we, I call this either general or standard conditions stuff just to know. So what do you need to know? Let me kind of fill this out for you before you leave. Okay. You need to know what is normally a gas in normal conditions, like our room conditions here. H2N2, O2, F2, Cl2. All those diatomics are normally gases, including carbon monoxide also, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen monoxide. All noble gases, the last column, are gases. Liquids. Water is a liquid, if you didn't know it. Bromine. That diatomic is a liquid. You need to know that. Mercury, that metal, is the only liquid in standard conditions. What are solids? Everything else. I2, that diatomic, is a solid. You'll learn why in the chemistry. Uh, metals are solids in standard conditions. Semi-metals, the metalloids, are solids. And any other non-metal we haven't mentioned yet is a solid. What's aqueous? Anything that is an ion, anything that has a charge that is not zero is an aqueous. You ever see anything with a charge is aqueous? And then go for 2C. Anything with a Z, what's Z? Atomic number greater than 83, so above business, right? Ammonium, which I'll bring you out. All right, that's a good place to end. I'll leave this out for the All right, who might have questions? Come up, but I didn't get